to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello, Dave. Hello, Matt. Hello, Jess. Hello, Dave. Hello to both of you. And can I just Ooh. say two small words? Yes. That is happy block. Oh, <gasps> happy block, Dave. I'm so excited. It's finally here. Oh, <laughs> oh, my my favourite time of year. <laughs> Blocktoberfest. It's happening. Do you know what? I reckon I reckon they're putting out block decorations earlier and earlier. <laughs> I saw some in April this Whoa, year. That's amazing. <laughs> I am so excited for uh, new listeners. Blocktoberfest or Blocktober Grace Period or whatever you want to call it is the month of the year where we do the biggest, most requested topics. We do the big ones, the blockbusters, and uh, I'm so pumped to get into it. Quick question for the listeners. What are you doing for block? Mm. Well, mm. I don't know. The question on, on everyone's lips. Is it possible that 2021 is the biggest block we've ever done? Is that possible? Dave, I know you're being facetious there, <laughs> but yes, it bloody is. It can be and it is because for the first time ever, last year we annexed the last Wednesday in September. This year we're annexing the whole of November for block. <laughs> block, for the first time ever, is going for two months. Is it two months block? No one's complaining, I hope. I hope not. Yeah, some of are going to be like, oh, I just want to get back to the trash yeah, topics. I like the obscure ones, thanks. These ones are too interesting. Block decorations seem to stay up longer every year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do you reckon it would benefit us to make every month Block month. And what I mean by that is do really good topics all the time. I mean, well, I think that's possible we could do it for nearly three years because this year Matt put up 140 topics for the vote. <laughs> it's nearly three years worth. Yeah. I mean, it would, and maybe it would make some sense, but I think it's fun sometimes to do yes. some more obscure topics. Absolutely. No, I think every single episode we've done has been an absolute banger. I don't think we, I don't think we can miss. Oh, I'm not suggesting we miss. No. Nothing but Ned every week. Every week. The How do they do it? 312 or whatever we're up to in a row. Mm. Whoa. But, yeah, sometimes we like to do some small ones. But this month or these months are all <laughs> about the big ones. These are the big famous topics that so many people have suggested. Um, Dave, how does this show work for new listeners just in general? Well, what we do is we research a topic. We take it in turns, go away, research the topic, bring it back to the other two in the form of a report and a uh, we don't know what the other person's going to talk about when we're not the ones reporting. And that's you, Matt. You're kicking off block this year. This is, what is that, eighth, ninth, something like that, most requested topic. And Jess and I, we're sitting here in anticipation. What's it going to be? And you start with a question to get us onto topic. That's right. So the question this week is, which infamous American serial killer <laughs> is sometimes referred to as the killer clown? Oh. Oh. Killer clown. That's definitely haunted a lot of people's nightmares. Mm. Um, bozo. Not bozo. This is an actual killer. <laughs> well, not that I know for sure bozo didn't kill. <laughs> kill before you kill again. Uh, I think I do know the answer to this one. Go ahead. I'm going to lock in John Wayne Gacy. That's correct. It is John Ooh. Wayne Gacy. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's rare that you read out that name and you'll get an ooh response. Yeah, good point. That felt wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's going to feel wronger as the episode goes along. Awesome. Want to be clear? I think that ooh was um, I've heard that name before but didn't know about the clown killer part. Yeah, so uh, John Wayne Gacy uh, just snuck in over the next most voted for topic, which we won't be doing, which was another serial killer. Oh. Ah. They're always pretty popular, the serial killer ones. People love the killers. Yeah. We haven't done one for a while, maybe not since yeah. last block even. I think maybe because we went, oh, these make us sad. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many true crime podcasts out there, but, I mean, how many are doing topics like... A treasure hunt by an eccentric millionaire. Good point. You know? Very good point. So we'll we'll stick to our lane most of the year, but for block, anything goes. The thing about our lane is it's so wide. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> wide. It's like one of those eight lane freeways yeah. in Germany or something, you exactly. know? Exactly. It's That's very us. much like a German freeway. The <laughs> Autobahn. <laughs> Don't say that, that right, Dave. <laughs> oh, perfect. How did you get it so right? Autobahn. <laughs> Get to the Autobahn, <laughs> then the chopper. 
<laughs> so uh, John Wayne Gacy has been suggested by multiple people. Let me read out some names. Uh, it was suggested by Callum Cole from Belfast, uh, Yusuf Javid, aka me, from Erskine, Scotland, Alec McElroy from Lawrence in Kansas in the United States, Connor Scuba Shark Reed from Manchester in the United <laughs> Kingdom, Laura Nickel from Brisbane, McKenna Middlebrook from Potsdam in New York in America, Shannon from Rhode Island in America, I assume, Odie Matthews from Salt Lake City in Utah in the United States, Ari Katz from Israel, Michael Luch from Moore in Oklahoma in the United States, Christina Gonzalez from Ventura, California, Austin Bain from Manchester in Maryland, but the US. Ventura, California, what country is that? I think in the United States. <laughs> I don't know why I was, yeah. I just read them out as they, they write them down. <laughs> I just felt like you'd back yourself into a corner where you had to say each country. <laughs> well, there was a little bit of that as well. And finally, Christian from Address Unknown. Um, <gasps> oh, mystery. So this probably goes without saying. Uh, this is a grim topic. And if mm. you're not in the mood for a grim topic, dear listener, this might be a skippable one for you. Uh, they don't get much more grim than this. Um, yeah. Not that I go, I'm not going into too many grisly details or anything like that, but it, yeah, it is a, he's a real bad guy. And, right. Uh, yeah, anyway, whatever. You understand what I'm saying. So um, we try and keep it light. Obviously, we're not making light of what he did. Here we go. The start uh, of my report here, a lot of it comes from uh, a Chicago Tribune article. Are you ready? Yes. On December 11th, 1978, at around 9 p.m., Robert Peast, a 15-year-old employee of the Nissan Pharmacy in Des Plaines, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, was finishing up his shift. His mother, Elizabeth, arrived to pick him up and drive him back to their Des Plaines house to celebrate her 46th birthday with uh, their family. Peast asked her to wait for him. He said he just had to see someone before they left saying he wanted to talk to a contractor about a job. Apparently he'd overheard someone while finishing his shift who suggested they had a labouring job that would pay double what he was earning at the pharmacy. While he said he would be back in a couple of minutes, he never returned. After waiting, Elizabeth Peast, his mother, became alarmed and drove back to her house before returning with her husband Harold, son Ken, daughter Carrie and the family's two German shepherds and they had a search around the neighbourhood but found no trace of their boy. At 11.29pm, Elizabeth Peast arrives at the Des Plaines Police Station to file a missing persons report for her son. After speaking to Elizabeth, Lieutenant Joseph Kozinchak is convinced that something sinister has happened he saw Peace as a good kid from a good family and was unlikely to be a runaway. It would have been quite strange for him to run away in that sort of scenario. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad that that's sort of the reaction because so often you hear like, they're like, uh, come back tomorrow. I'm sure he's going to be. Yeah. He'll turn up, whatever. Kids, they, kids wander off. And it's like, no, he just spoke to his mum yeah. and said, just give me a sec. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I think there was a lot of that in this story. Okay. Um, Damn. A lot of a lot of parents and and stories might have been dismissed at different times. Even just the way they talked, the policeman talked about he was a good kid from a good family, very unlikely to be a runaway. Yeah, sort of that's, almost ugh. suggests that you go if he's making calls about other kids, you're going, oh, they're the kind of kid who might have run away. So maybe yeah. I won't investigate it quite as hard. Yeah, this kid really loves school, and he his family, yeah. you know, is upstanding members or whatever. Well, let's really investigate anyway. Yeah. They just sounded a little bit like that. The owner of the Nissan pharmacy, Phil Torf, suggested that a man named John Wayne Gacy was most likely the contractor Peast had mentioned. Gacy was at the pharmacy to discuss a remodeling job with Torf. Uh, he just remodeled the pharmacy. Gacy, a 36 year old man, ran a construction business called PDM Contractors. PDM stood for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. Huh. PDM had come to specialise in pharmacy remodelling and in 1978 had an annual revenue of about $200,000 or about $850,000 in today's money. So it was a pretty successful company. Specialising in yeah. pharmacies. That seems yeah. so obscure. How interesting, yeah. 
Yeah, so apparently he was, you know, quite a good talker. He'd go into a pharmacy and say, I can remodel this to really um, maximise sales and that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. It's all about positioning and levels and having things, you know, lines of sight and all this sort of stuff. Is he dressed as a clown when he's doing this? No. That would really stand out. Yeah. You'd remember that guy. Yeah, he's the clown contractor. Yeah. He you know comes the clown? In. Hey, hey, the oh, oh, hey, 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 starts juggling and then you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you know, before you know it, you signed a contract to remodel your pharmacy. That's <laughs> a clown. That's how it gets you. Somehow he does it. He takes your mind off it. He's one of those close-up magic clowns, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look over here. Sign the contract over here. Ooh. I'm sorry, Matt, what, um, what year was this? 1978. Thank you. Yeah, right, okay. So the pharmacy owner, Torf, let the cops know the only contractor that I know of who was there, I was actually meeting with him, Don Wayne Gacy, uh, this is who he is sort of thing. Uh, with that tip, the police decide to investigate Gacy further. So he's asked to come into the police station for questioning. He calls Cousin Jack, uh, the lieutenant, back at 11 p.m. asking, do you still want to talk to me? And Cousin Jack responds, yeah, how long do you think it will take you to get here? Gacy replies, about a half hour. But two hours later, the lieutenant was still waiting at 1 a.m. Finally, at 3.20 a.m., Gacy wanders into the Des Plaines police station with mud stains on his pants and shoes. Cousin Shack is no longer there, though, and Gacy is told to come back later in the day, which he does, giving a brief statement saying he has no knowledge about the disappearance. On the surface, Gacy was seen as an upstanding member of the community. He ran a successful business in PDM, construction. He was involved in local politics and was a member of multiple community groups. But then on December the 20th, a few days later, the police learnt via a routine background check that he had served time in Iowa for the sodomy of a 15-year-old boy when he was 26, as well as an outstanding battery charge against him in Chicago. So all of a sudden they're like, we're definitely onto our man here. Yeah. Uh, Cousin Chuck asked Gacy for the keys to his house, uh, showing him a search warrant. Gacy protested this but eventually surrendered his keys. Inside the house, police and Cook County Sheriff's Office evidence technicians discover a receipt for a roll of film being developed. The Peace family says the receipt belongs to a female friend of their son. Uh, Peace offered to have the film developed for her. That connected Peace directly to the house. They also seize other items from inside, including a Maine West High School ring, as well as Gacy's car, van and a pickup truck to be searched later. And that was in his house? That was all in his house. The ring wasn't connected to Peace. It was a different school, but it was just another interesting piece of evidence. They're like, well, this doesn't seem to belong here. Yeah. Uh, Amazingly, the, the cops, they found that receipt in the bin was something they said, uh, we assume this is, he, he was just getting photos developed, but we'll take it just in case. And it turned out to be a real key piece of evidence. Wow. So it belonged to the kid's friend. Yes. And he said, I'll, I'll get them developed for you. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Or you know, And it seems like she may have uh, borrowed his jacket and put it in there. Uh. Or, yeah. It, somehow he ended up with this receipt, though. Wow. Uh, no other items relating to Peace are found, but police conclude Peace was clearly in Gacy's house. Gacy, who had been twice married and twice divorced at this point and was currently living alone, was released from jail around 11 p.m. So they, they didn't quite have enough to go in, but they, they're like, we feel like this is our man, we're going to have to get more evidence, and they kept working on that. Well, I'm going to leave that there and go back to the start. So John Wayne Gacy, born March 17th, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois, is the second child of John and Marion Gacy. Biography.com states that Gacy was born into a blue-collar family and seems to have had a fairly ordinary childhood. That doesn't seem to stack up against multiple other sources where they say his early years were anything but ordinary, suffering beatings from his alcoholic father and being sexually abused by a family friend on multiple occasions. According to Alec Wilkinson, writing for The New Yorker, Alex Wilkinson later sat down over multiple sessions to interview Gacy. So he's he's one of my main sources that I'll quote from. 
Uh, so Wilkinson writes, when Gacy was a child, his father spent hours by himself in the basement of the house where they were living in Chicago. His wife and son and two daughters were prohibited from going down there. Uh, through the floor, they sometimes heard him talking in different voices. When he emerged, he was often drunk and likely to be violent. One evening, he struck his wife so hard that he knocked out some of her teeth and then he chased her into the street and beat her some more. Though by the sounds of it, John Wayne Gacy did not have a an ideal or standard childhood. I'd love to know what History.com sees as a standard childhood. Yeah, Biography.com. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, right? Yeah, no, run of the mill, nothing <laughs> yeah, out of the nothing ordinary. nothing to see here. Having said that, we only write biographies about serial killers, so uh, anyway, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I myself am a serial <laughs> yeah, killer, like, so that's no, normal for me. I think it's, um yeah, it's, a, it's sort of tricky territory because you're like, uh, you don't want to excuse what he became because of his childhood, but, I mean, of feels like it's, you know, worth mentioning perhaps. It's pretty. It's a pretty common theme that you tend to tend to see in in people who go on to do stuff like this. And that's not to say that everybody who has a traumatic childhood is a serial killer, but, you know, you do tend to see it a lot in these killer episodes. Skip ahead a little bit. When Gacy was 18, he started getting involved with the Democratic Party, working as an assistant precinct captain for a candidate in his area. When he was 20, he ran away from home uh, to Las Vegas. He dropped out of school Young, he um, had a bit of a tough time at school. He sort of had health issues. He he believed he had a a heart issue. His dad didn't really believe him, thought he was just trying to get sympathy. He, yeah, ran away from home at 20. Can you say you're running away from home when you're 20? (laughs) It is interesting, right? Because he he only, I mean, I phrase it that way because I read it that way a few times, but he Mm. left without telling his parents. He was paying off his car and he'd fallen one payment behind through his dad and his dad, you know, took the keys off him. So he had to sort of take the car from his dad basically and, yeah, he, he ran away to Las Vegas. He had $136 to his name. By the time he got to Vegas after petrol and motel costs, uh, he arrived with 35 bucks. Then he went to a casino, gambled 25 of those dollars, said he had a bad run of luck and then slept in his car uh before passing out in the hot Nevada sun, saying he's like, you know, I was used to the milder climates of Chicago. I didn't know you had, didn't leave your windows up in the baking desert sun. <laughs> uh, he awoke to find an ambulance pulling him out, taking him to hospital. After being released, he was unable to pay the ambulance fee. He offered to pay the debt by washing ambulances, but he was instead offered a job. I think the ambulance boss at this depot was like, like your moxie kind of thing. Hey, appreciate you being truthful there, <laughs> young man. Want a job? He's like, yeah, great. Turned out, though, that he needed to be 21 and he was only 20. So instead, the ambulance guy found him a job working at the local mortuary and uh, that's where he lived and worked for about three months. <laughs> All right. Oh. You're not old enough to wash ambulances, but you are old enough to wash dead bodies. Come on over. <laughs> yeah. According, this is pretty full on. According to Wilkinson, who was able to interview Gacy, as I said before, later in 1994, Gacy told me that he grew homesick and went back to Illinois in the beginning of July. But other accounts say that one night in the mortuary, he climbed into a coffin containing the body of a boy whose manner of death had left him with an erection and arranged the body on top of him. He grew frightened and jumped out and the next day called his mother and asked if she thought that his father would allow him to come home. His father agreed, said, yes, you can come home, uh, and he he went back to Chicago the following day. Once home, he enrolled at Northwestern Business College, graduating in 1963 before taking a trainee position with a shoe company. In 1964, he was transferred to Springfield, Illinois, to work as a shoe salesman. In time, he was promoted to department manager and while there he started dating co-worker Marilyn Myers. Gacy told Wilkinson that while working as a shoe salesman, he put a lot of effort into his clothes saying, just by looking at me, he knew I had to be the boss. I dressed and looked like an owner or a millionaire, (laughs) even when I was young. I never wore brown because a man from a menswear brand said, I didn't look good in brown. I like rich dark colours, blues, blacks. Burgundy, greys, olives, some wool, but I stayed with shark skins and silks because of the richness. 
So you dress like a boss. Like I'm imagining a guy, it's, he's got a name tag that says, hi, my name is the boss. Yeah. 22-year-old <laughs> guy, just really a lot of weird self-belief in him, you know. Yeah. If given the chance, when in any of the interviews or other people who knew him through his life, they're like, he would talk your ear off, a real blowhard, you know, especially he'd talk about himself, favourite topic, and he'll he'll go on for hours sort of thing. After dating for six months, Gacy married Marilyn Myers uh, in September of 1964. They were to move to Waterloo, Iowa, so Gacy could manage the three Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets Myers' father had purchased. It was a big deal for the newlyweds with Gacy earning a salary of 15 grand a year plus a share in the profits, 15 grand being about 130 grand today. Oh, damn, yeah, good, good money. money. for a guy who just before was living in a mortuary yeah. uh, because he had no money. After Gacy graduated from the KFC Chicken School <laughs> in Louisville, Kentucky, the couple moved to Waterloo. Sorry, is that a real thing? Apparently, that yeah. broke, Dave. <laughs> they call it the Chicken School. Isn't it, doesn't McDonald's have like McDonald's University or something? Yeah, I think that's right. I think one of you talked that about it in that was a McDonald's long time episode. ago. The Chicken yeah. School sort of implies you look around and all your fellow students are all chickens. <laughs> yeah, you're all there to learn yeah. to be a chicken. I think I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> He's like, he, he wouldn't be thinking like that. He'd be there going, so much smarter than all these idiots. Yeah, right. yeah. How do I assert to these chickens that I'm the boss? <laughs> if I told you that he was going to go to a novelty uh, learning uh, establishment, you would have guessed clown college, right? Yeah, 100%. No. Yeah, chicken, chicken school. school. Yeah. <laughs> chicken school, there you go. Yeah, graduated chicken school. <laughs> Once there, he converted his basement into a kind of staff club for his mainly teenaged employees where they could play pool and drink booze. Gacy gave many of his teenage employees alcohol before he made sexual advances. When they knocked him back, he claimed he was only joking. Ugh. Gacy also joined the local JCs. I don't know if you, I hadn't heard of this, the JCs. It seems like it's maybe a relatively common thing. In America, maybe it's like the Apex. Have you heard of Apex in Australia? It's just sort of like a community group. Oh. So it's short for Junior Chamber or the United States Junior, junior Chamber, a not-for-profit organisation that focuses on business development, management skills, individual training, community service and international connections for people aged 18 to 40. Sounds boring! <laughs> Apparently... <laughs> It's sort of, it sounds, it's a real weird sounding place. This particular, I don't think this is all JCs, but this particular branch of the JCs sounded real strange. Apparently, they would regularly show porn films. So they'd have meetings and they're watching porn as a group. <laughs> they'd hire sex workers get, and get involved with partner swapping. Right. And then they're like, anyway, now on to business. Business. That's mm. what we're here for. I mean, that's all okay, a guys. bit of fun around the sides, but all we're right. here. We've had our social to time. Network. Back to business chat. <laughs> Now, whose wife am I going to fuck? <laughs> First on the agenda. <laughs> uh, at JC's meetings, he would provide free fried chicken for the other members and insist that they called him Colonel. <laughs> okay. <Ooh. laughs> I hate that. They're like, hey, John. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, uh, uh. Colonel. Yeah, what do you need? Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Gacy rose fast up the ranks of the Springfield JCs and by 1965 had become the vice president of the chapter. Oh, how many ranks below a colonel is that? Yeah, he must feel weird about that. Like, the actual colonel. Not the VP, I'm the colonel. <laughs> so he was also recognised as the third most outstanding JC in the state of Illinois. Hey, there's something about him that people seem to like. Wow. Uh, like a lot of psychos we've talked about, has some level of charisma. Yeah. Yeah, seems to be able to make people like him. I wonder how shocking it is because obviously he's such a sociable guy. So many people know who he is. Like in 15 years' time or whatever when he's busted and is all over the news, if everyone's like, oh, my God, that's John, that's the Colonel. Or if they're like, yeah, yeah, mm. I thought he was a bit odd. I wonder if they're. Yeah, that's not a surprise. Yeah. yeah. So many people obviously know him. He's part of clubs. He's moved all over. Like, yeah. But have you not met people or, like, you know, interacted with acquaintances and you're like, if I found out they'd, you know, murdered someone, I wouldn't be shocked? How many people do you feel this way about, yeah. Bob? Jess, are you looking at one right now? Uh, maybe. 
Maybe I'm looking at a couple. <laughs> no, of course not. Um, but, you know, there's, I, I wouldn't say, like, going on a full serial killer spree, but there's definitely people, I'm like, if you did something creepy, it wouldn't shock me. Right. These aren't friends. These are, like, acquaintances at best. Gotcha. Colonels. <laughs> they all demand to be called colonels. It's a real, it's an early sign. Anybody who says, please, call me colonel, get the <laughs> fuck away from that person. We have all this other knowledge about him, but it just feels yeah. like this guy insisting you call him Colonel. I mean, there's yeah. other things. There's things like him having set up a clubhouse where he gives alcohol to minors is also probably, yeah. a, you know, quite a large red flag. Cracks onto them and then says, I'm only joking <laughs> when they say no. Yeah, I get the impression that this is all, like, this isn't like a, this is an out there knowledge. I don't think the parents are probably knowing about this as far as I assume. And then in August of 1967, Gacy sexually assaulted the 15-year-old son of another JC member. He lured him to his house promising to show him pornography like they'd play at the JC club before plying him with alcohol and sexually assaulting him. According to Wilkinson, on a few occasions during the fall, Gacy paid him for sex. Around the same time, Gacy assaulted another boy, one who worked for him, he said that after work one night, Gacy offered to drive him home. They ended up at Gacy's house. Gacy's wife was in the hospital giving birth to their second child. Oh, my God. Uh, when Gacy served the boy whiskey, they watched stag films, which apparently was apparently a type of porn film from the olden days. Uh, then Gacy attacked him and strangled him until he nearly passed out. When the boy revived, Gacy said that he hadn't meant to hurt him and he drove him home. Then a few days later, fired him. Oh, God. Yuck. An absolute piece of shit. Not that that's a surprise, but yuck. The first boy told his father, who went to the police, and Gacy was arrested and charged with committing oral sodomy. So this is the charge that the police would later um, uncover. Yeah, right. Wilkinson continues. Word of the boy's story spread through the town in the days before the indictment and the County's attorney's office found other boys who said that they had been to Gacy's house and that Gacy had asked them to go down on him or had tried to convince them to allow him to go down on them. Gacy asked to be given a lie detector test and he failed it. He asked to be given another and he failed that one too. <laughs> Why are you asking? That's so dumb. Why are you asking for a lie detector test when you know you're lying? Best of seven. <laughs> you, know, you can just picture him go going up. Go again. Yeah. Go again. All right. go again. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Go again. I'm sorry, go I think again. I'm getting it now. That's Moses like, <laughs> I don't deserve this kind of shoddy treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After failing it twice, apparently in the county attorney's office, it was said that the only answer he got right was his name. I think it sounds like that was a little joke they had around the office. In August 1968, Gacy engaged a high school senior to intimidate the boy and keep him from testifying at his trial. The senior drove the younger boy into the woods outside town and sprayed mace in his eyes, then oh. beat him up and told him not to testify. What the fuck? The boy broke free and hid in a cornfield. When he got back into town, he went to the police and gave them the name of his attacker. Uh, the senior student told the police that Gacy had provided the mace and had promised to pay off his car loan. Gacy pleaded guilty to sodomy and he expected to receive probation and to be allowed to move back to Illinois. Instead, he got 10 years at the Iowa State Reformatory for Men in Anamosa. They got quite a solid sentence, a 10-year sentence for this. In the court proceedings, uh, he was psychiatrically evaluated, and part of that evaluation read, the most striking aspect of his test results is the patient's total denial of responsibility for everything that has happened to him. He can produce an alibi for everything. He presents himself as a victim of circumstances and blames other people who are out to get him. The patient attempts to assure a sympathetic response by depicting himself as being at the mercy of a hostile environment. So spot on, way before he committed most of his crimes, there was all these huge red flags, but now mm. he was going away for 10 years, so... Uh, the judge said that the severity of his sentence was intended to make certain that for some period of time you cannot seek out teenage boys to solicit them for immoral behaviour of any kind. While Gacy was in the reformatory, his wife divorced him and he never saw his wife or children again. After serving only 18 months, though, 
he was paroled. In June of 1970, uh, he left for Chicago. There he moved into his mother's apartment and got a job at, uh, as a restaurant cook. He often told people he met there that his ex-wife was the daughter of Colonel Sanders, the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, which was a real weird lie. (laughs) That's such a strange lie. I can't believe he served 18 months of a 10-year sentence. Yes. It seems like a a real small sliver of what he was meant to be. Yeah, we'll give you an 85% reduction. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and and that for, you know, for some period of time you can't, Engaged teenage boys. Yeah, the judge did not sound confident that once he was back out that he'd, he wouldn't go straight back to it. And the judge yeah. was correct if that's what they were thinking. Oh. Apparently he was a model inmate in jail and that was part of the reason why he was paroled so early, I guess. Part of his parole conditions was that he had to live with his mother, which he did, as well as adhere to a 10pm curfew and obviously not be a sexual predator. Unfortunately, while he did live with his mother, he did not adhere to the other two stipulations. On February the 12th, 1971, Gacy was charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy after luring him into his car at Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal before driving him home. The charge was dropped, though, when the boy failed to appear in court. Then on June 22nd, Gacy was arrested and charged with aggravated sexual battery and reckless conduct. Gacy was said to have flashed a sheriff's badge to lure another teenage boy into his car before assaulting him. These charges were also dropped after the victim attempted to blackmail Gacy. If either of those stuck, they would have connected back to the jail term and you would assume he would have gone away again for a longer sentence. Unfortunately, neither of those charges stuck and somehow the Iowa Board of Parole weren't made aware of these incidents. So... Uh, in October of 1971, Gacy's parole ended. They assumed that he he hadn't been um, up to any trouble. They just they, there was no connection between the states, I guess. Fuck. And then uh, the records of his previous criminal convictions in Iowa were sealed at that point. It was around this time that he started building up his PDM construction business while working part time as a cook. Uh, Gacy hired teenage boys and young men to be his labourers. According to journalist Tim Cahill, not the uh, the soccer root, right? <laughs> I assume or maybe. But are you proud of me for recognising that name and going, wait, what? Tim, Tim Cahill? Cahill? Timmy. Are you proud of that? Very proud. Thank and you. And a couple of weeks after, I mean, I wasn't here for the World Cup episode. I imagine Timmy Cahill oh. was mentioned quite a bit in the FIFA World Cup. Almost too yeah, much, to be honest. The greatest ever player. The greatest ever forehead to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> Just kept yammering on about Timmy Cahill. Timmy Cahill. Uh, so anyway, according to journalist Tim Cahill, in his book about Gacy, uh, buried dreams inside the mind of a serial killer, Gacy would regularly proposition his workers for sex or insist on sexual favours in return for acts such as lending his vehicles, financial assistance or promotions. Yuck. Yes. According to Wilkinson, he needed a place to store the lumber and paint cans and ladders he used for his business. His mother's apartment was too small. So she sold the apartment and bought uh, them a house at uh, 8213 West Summerdale Avenue in Norwood Park, a suburb near the airport, and they moved there during August 1971. It is believed that Gacy's first murder was in January of 1972. 16-year-old Timothy McCoy was travelling from Michigan to Nebraska with a stopover in Chicago. This is like a story we have told us before. Gacy was cre- uh, sort of creeping around the Greyhound bus station where he met up with Timothy McCoy and convinced him to come with him on a sightseeing tour of Chicago, which they did. Apparently they went around Chicago looking at the sights. Then uh, he invited uh, McCoy to stay at his house, promising he'd return him to the bus depot in the morning in time for his next bus. According to Gacy, early in the morning... He woke to see McCoy in the doorway of his room with a kitchen knife in one hand. Gacy charged the boy and got control of the knife before stabbing him several times. Gacy then claims he went into his kitchen and saw that McCoy had set the table for two and was preparing breakfast, seemingly having (gasps) walked into Gacy's bedroom absentmindedly carrying the kitchen knife. Oh, whoa. And that's according to Gacy. Oh, my God. Because it does sound a bit like at first you're expecting that story to be like, oh, he's just bullshitting or whatever. But yes. oh, yeah, totally. Okay, yeah, no, that 
actually. It was self-defense. Oh, my God. The, the way he tells the story in the when he sort of uh, wrestled McCoy, he got cut with the knife while he was trying to get it off him and he has a scar that matches the story. So I think it's believed that that is what happened. Oh, my God, that is horrendous. Was the mum still living in the house? I think she she was normally away. Right. Uh, I don't know if she was away for this one, but these incidents would tend to happen when she was away visiting her sister or something like that. Yeah, right. Gacy buried McCoy's body under the house, under the crawl space, under his floor, and he later said that it was then that he realised that death was the ultimate thrill. <laughs> Oh, yuck. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to say yuck a lot this episode. Uh, this might be I've the, already said the it a yuckest lot. episode we've ever done, possibly. I mean, we've done some yuck, yuck. ones. Yeah, um, we So have. he might have got to it anyway, but, like, is that poor boy accidentally walking in with a knife, is that kind of what tipped him, John Wayne Gacy, into, like, killing more people? That's, I mean, that's what it seems like. That sort of oh, seems like man, how he Oh, man, what tells horrible. It. It's, it's just, that chance situation just got way worse. Yeah. I mean, yeah, who knows? Like, if that was inside him, you know, maybe Yeah, for sure. It's so hard to say, but, oh. Uh, he, he was a sex offender over and over again. Yeah. Not that that necessarily leads to murder, but just feels like it, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm well outside my area of expertise. <laughs> no, I majored in criminology, but. Hey, that's right. You're the one you should know. Yeah, it's not quite the same, but it's more psychology and stuff. But... Teach you the mind of a serial killer? No. <laughs> On July the 1st, 1972, Gacy married again. He married Carol Hoff, who Gacy knew as a friend of his sister in high school. Who did he marry Carol Hoff to? Bit of fun there. <laughs> Bit of fun. Thanks, Dave. We'll find it wherever we can. In this <laughs> Honestly, episode. I'm grasping onto anything I can. I'm like, oh, this, sounds le- this bit's not quite grim. He married Carol Hoff to his friend. <laughs> Is that what I said? So he, he married Carol Hoff, who he knew as a friend of his sister in high school. Uh, and Hoff was uh, a divorcee with two young daughters. And the three of them moved into Gacy's house while his mum moved out into a rented apartment. According to Wilkinson, throughout the summer of 1972, Carol noticed a smell that seemed to come from something decaying in the crawl space. In a back room was a swarm of flies, which she thought might be feeding on whatever was down there. Maybe dead mice, she thought. Gacy said the odour was the result of a runoff from a broken sewer pipe and he spread lime in the crawl space to try and control it, but the odour got worse. Carol left on a trip and when she got back, Gacy told her that he had poured concrete over a, a section of the crawl space to get rid of the smell. The flies disappeared, but the smell remained only fainter. Sometimes she saw Gacy drop into the crawl space carrying a 50-pound bag of lime to spread over the damp ground. Nine days before their wedding... Gacy had been arrested again. Uh, somehow he must have kept this from her or at least convincing her that it was a mistake and that he was in- innocent. The police said he had told a boy that he was a deputy sheriff and ordered the boy into his car. He forced the boy to go down on him and afterward the boy jumped out of the car and Gacy tried to run him over. For some reason the charges were dropped. This just happens again and again. What? The, the cops are made aware of these things and they just don't quite go anywhere. And, uh, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but some of them, it just feels like the cops are going, yeah, likely story or whatever. But in their head, they're not connecting all of these things together because none of them go that far. So there's not a record. There's not a file on him where they could go, John Wayne Gacy, ooh, he's, this seems like his MO. Mm. Apart from in Iowa, never quite gets in trouble. I'm not fully sure how he got away with it. Perhaps it was because he was seen as a respected member of his community and was apparently well-liked by his neighbours. He hosted summer parties attended by hundreds of people. I think I read 400 people, something like that. Whoa. Uh, and, and that included influential people like politicians. This is to his house where he's got a body under the floor. And as the, you know, each year, more and more bodies under the floor. According to Wilkinson, in the summer of 1973, Gacy took over the garage of his house for his contracting business, telling his wife and stepdaughters to stay out of it. He was often gone most of the night, and when Carol asked where he'd been, he said visiting stores and construction sites that he'd hoped to bid on and talking to people about work he might do. Late at night, he said, 
He could see more places and have more conversations than he was able to during the day. Obviously, I'm just out in the middle of the night. Yeah, 4 a.m. meeting with a guy yeah. about a possible... I can do more at night, Carol. Carol, you don't get it. Construction. Oh, my God, Carol. Easiest time to talk to people is 4 a.m. You don't get it. It's okay. Okay, you don't get it. Your tiny little woman brain can't wrap your head around it. But don't worry, okay? Just out here trying to earn some money, you know, we can get your daughters some pretty little bows for their hair <laughs> or some shit. And whatever you do, do not look in the crawl space. Anyway, got to go. Anyway, love you, bye. Uh, beneath the sink in the kitchen, she found some magazine featuring naked men. Uh, one of the pictures was of a young man who appeared to have blood on his body. Before they got married, Gacy told her that he was bisexual and apparently she thought he was joking. It was a weird scenario, but... It's a funny joke. Yeah. So she was surprised to find this magazine with naked men. When she confronted him about seeing teenage boys entering their home via the garage in the early mornings and also finding men's wallets and IDs in the house, he angrily told her to mind her own business. Nothing to do with you why I have teenage boys so coming in. So she's seeing teenage boys going into the garage, doesn't see them leave, by the way, finding wallets around the house. I think most of them do leave again. I think yeah. not all of them he's killing. Quite a few of them he does, though. Fucking hell. Carol. <laughs> Are you blaming Carol? I'm not blaming Carol, but I'm saying, like, you're finding some pretty solid evidence yeah. here, some re- some big old red yes. flags. no, you're of right. Of course it's not her I fault, mean, I was about to say, me. come on, how would she know? But, yeah, it's it's not. <laughs> how do you Someone's you, you not can't right. explain that away even in your head. No, I don't think you immediately jump to murder, but you do go, something's a bit, are you th- stealing people's wallets? Yeah. Like, you know, you'd go to something like that. I thought he was joking. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> it was funny. It was a funny bit. It was a very funny it, joke. We all very roared with gag. laughter. <laughs> he'd grab wallets and he'd spread them throughout the house. Very funny. Bit of fun. I don't know He's what a his funny Gettys guy. Jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bit postmodern for me. I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> if I don't laugh, he gets offended, so I just laugh. <laughs> I'm really into more observational kind of humour, personally. He's a bit he's a bit left field, but, you know, he's all right. Honestly, I laugh because I don't want to look silly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, according to Cahill, in 1973, Gacy travelled to Florida to view a newly purchased property with a teenage employee. On the first night, Gacy raped him in their hotel room on returning to Chicago, the employee went to Gacy's house and beat the shit out of him on his front lawn. To explain the beating, Gacy told Carol he was attacked for refusing to pay the the boy because he did a poor painting job. Oh, yeah, why did he beat me? Oh, it's because he's just bitter I didn't pay him because he's not good at painting, not because I raped him. No, definitely not. In January of 1974, there was there was just a little bit of me like, yeah, fuck, you know, like there's just a little bit of like. I was, a, yeah, I was absolutely thinking like, good. But, yeah, I don't know. This, I mean, spending a week with John Wayne Gacy in my head has not been pleasant. No. If I'm acting weird, <laughs> that's why. But I look forward to whatever next week's topic is, which I'm sure is going to be a lot more fun-loving. Can I suggest tomorrow you just spend some time watching some Disney classics or something? Nothing bad happens in that, Nothing right? Nothing bad happens in Bambi. <laughs> start with Bambi and see how you go. I'll start with Bambi. I mean, cute little deers running around. Cute little deers. His best friend's a little rabbit named Thumper. Cute. That's cute. Just want to watch one thing without murder. <laughs> Bambi's got to be the one. Yeah. And you're a vegetarian. You love animals. Yeah, I do. <laughs> So I'd love to spend a bit of time just watching them trotting about. Yes, watching them be free. Having a chat. Not even really a story. It's just you just watch them walk, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. like a, what do you call it? One of those slow yeah, movies. Yeah, that's right. Called. Slow TV. Yeah. Just beautiful. Just well animated, you know? Great stuff. Oh, that's so good. I watched a, a side-by-side YouTube video last night. Probably, It's funny that it was at a Disney. This is probably exactly why I did it subconsciously, just to a little quick <laughs> cleanse. But it showed multiple of their movies. They just fully reused animations. So there's like a scene where uh, Mog- Mogwai, I think, from the Jungle Book. Mowgli. Mowgli. Mogwai is a band. Anyway, um, <laughs> Mowgli walking up a little cliff and there's the exact same thing with Peter 
Robin or whatever from um, Winnie the Pooh Bear. Oh, that's right. And there's a bunch of these yeah. scenes. There's dances with a big blue bear in a couple of movies. He's just wearing a slightly different clothes. That was yeah. interesting. They were lazy back then. When they had to do everything frame for oh, frame by hand, exactly. I don't blame them. These days, though, I'm like, you bloody reuse anything. <laughs> I will kill you, Disney. Nah, not at all. Just felt weird saying that on a serial killer episode. <laughs> I won't. I won't do anything of No red sort. flags here from Bob. No, 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 no. Don't very. Look into this. I was going to say very mentally healthy. That's not true, but not in a murdery way. <laughs> More in a sad on the inside kind of way. You don't even have a crawl space, do you? No, I live in an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Bury it in your neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my crawl space is occupied by a lovely couple and their dog. It's a nightmare. You, you tell them you live in a one bedroom apartment now. <laughs> Do not go in there. I'm just going to come down every week with a whole bunch of lime. <laughs> What's your plan here, Bob, to thaw Walt just so you can kill him again? <laughs> yeah, that's my plan. Mm. Thaw him out, say, G'day, Walt, let me catch you up. It's 2021, a lot has happened. <laughs> then I'm going to spend a couple of hours with him just catching him up on stuff that's happened. Pixar? Yeah. Oh my God, that's going to love mind. Pixar. And then I'm going to kill him all over <laughs> again. <laughs> I assume he was killed in the first place. Yes. Double indemnity. You can't kill a dead man. Can't kill a dead man. Am I using that term right? Double indemnity? <laughs> Double jeopardy. Diplomatic immunity. I don't know. You one got, of these. You got one of Finally, right. Yeah, anyway, back to this fucking grim tale. In January of 1974, it is believed Gacy committed his second murder, strangling a teenage boy. The identity of this victim is still unknown. There are multiple victims that are still... Basically, John Doe's there, unknown. Wow. That's awful. Yeah. In May of 1975, Gacy hired 15 year old Anthony Antonucci. A couple of months later, Gacy went to Antonucci's home where they drank wine before Gacy pinned Antonucci on the floor and cuffed his hands behind his back. Luckily for Antonucci, he was able to free one arm while Gacy had left the room. Antonucci, this is something that Gacy, uh, Gacy might not have known, but Antonucci was a competitive high school wrestler. And when Gacy returned, Antonucci wrestled him to the floor, got the handcuff keys off him and cuffed Gacy's hands behind his back. Whoa. Well done. Uh, with his hands pinned behind his back, Gacy threatened Antonucci. Not coming from a strong <laughs> position there, Gacy. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I swear to God, I'll, um, I'll run at you. <laughs> in a weird duck-like fashion because yeah. my hands are behind my back and I'll look bloody silly while I do it. He, he threatened him for a bit and then he sort of he started um, going, hey, oh, I'll calm down, Let me the, get, get the cuffs off me and I'll just leave. And that's what happened. He, he uh, took the cuffs off, he left. Nothing seemed to come of that. Antonucci later quoted Gacy as telling him, not only are you the only one who got out of the cuffs, you got them on me. Is like, wait, what do you mean the only one who... Yeah, oh, yuck. On July 31st, 1975, 18-year-old John Butkovich disappeared. Butkovich was a labourer for Gacy. His car was found with the keys still in the ignition and his jacket and wallet inside. Butkovich's father called Gacy to see if he knew his whereabouts. Gacy said he didn't know anything, but that he was sorry that his son had run away. No one said yeah, hang on, run what? away, Gacy. No one said that. I was wondering if he's with you now, like working on the site. Uh, what? Yeah. He's just like half an hour late home from work. We're just checking if he's all right. Oh, so sorry that he's, yeah, he's long run gone. away. I assume. You have to assume from what, you, what you've told me. Yeah, from that bit of information, I can only assume the worst. <laughs> uh, police interviewed Gacy about it, who told them Butkovich had arrived at his house demanding overdue pay. Gacy was behind in payments to Butkovich. Uh, but Gacy said they made a, made a compromise and they left on good terms. Butkovich's parents didn't believe Gacy. They thought he was at the heart of the disappearance. And despite begging the police to investigate him further, apparently they called the cops more than 100 times asking them to investigate him further. They never really did. Much later, late, uh, Gacy admitted he invited Butkovich into his car to drive to his home to settle his overdue wages. Once at his home, Gacy gave Butkovich a drink, then somehow conned him into having his wrists cuffed behind his back. 
Apparently, this is a tactic Gacy used on multiple occasions. He'd show the victim how he could escape from the cuffs. Gacy would cuff himself, you know, and do it. He'd go, look, I escaped the cuffs. I can teach you how to do it now. Cuffed them. And then he, you know, did what he did. Yeah, assaulted them. So once cuffed, Gacy killed Butkovich by strangulation. Uh, then he took his body into the garage, intending to later bury him under the house. But his wife, Carol, and stepdaughters arrived home early, so he had to quickly bury Butkovich under the garage in a spot that was meant for a drain. Around this time, Gacy became involved with local politics. He offered the use of his employees to clean the local Democratic Party headquarters for free and was rewarded. From there, he worked his way up uh before earning the title of precinct captain. Uh, precinct colonel is probably what he preferred to be called. They're like, <laughs> mate, right. that title doesn't exist. <laughs> no, no, no. If I'm going to get my guys to clean your place, you're going to call me the precinct colonel, okay? I'm, I'm the colonel of clean. Thank you so much. I, saw, I started thinking, I'm like, wait, I had this vague memory of Ted Bundy being involved in politics as well. So I looked that up and, yeah, about a year ago we did an episode on Ted Bundy who was involved with the Republican Party. So I don't know, it's like a small sample size, but it seems like there's some connection between psychotic killers and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and party politics. It's good to know it's bipartisan, though. That's right, yeah. Gacy was also appointed as the director of Chicago's annual Polish Constitution Day Parade. He had a Polish ancestry, and he would supervise the annual event from 1975 until 1978. Uh, via his work with the parade in 1978, he met and had his photo taken with First Lady Rosalind Carter. By this stage, he'd killed many, many people. Oh, wow. Uh, so Rosalind Carter was wife to the 39th president of America, Jimmy Carter, mm. which reminds me of the old adage, uh, well, Scooby-Doo can do do, <laughs> but Jimmy Carter is smarter. Mm. Well said, well said. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's crazy that he's he's like killed numerous people and just gotten away with it and then there's so many instances where if they just, you know, probed a little harder, it, or so many deaths could have been prevented. Yeah, they really just, you know, like a, a pretty good search of his house from one of these crimes Yeah, would have stopped so many more of them happening. Yeah, I'm amazed at just how busy he is. How does he do all this extracurricular stuff, manage a business, work somewhere else, kill all these mm. people up all night? Like, how does he? Yeah, he doesn't sleep. And it, it's, it was kind of amazing that despite, like, he was he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Despite this, he was given special clearance by the, the special service to be in that same room as, as um, Rosalind yeah. Carter. In the photo, he's wearing a badge which shows that he was given this special clearance. So later when everything came out about him, it was very embarrassing for the special service that they seemed to have given him that clearance. They deny yeah. that it, that they gave him that clearance, but it seems like they they did, mm. which is, yeah, amazing. It's like, what kind of system have you got going here? In October of 1975, Gacy blew up at his wife, Carol, for failing to balance a checkbook correctly. After this, she asked for a divorce. This was that, that was the final straw. Yeah, I was going to say. It's because that sounds like a final straw and not, you know, yeah. a one and done kind of argument. By March 1976, the divorce was finalised and Carol and her daughters had moved out. I'm so glad that it seems like the daughters, as far as I know, when I heard, when I was reading, they're moving in, I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I had that thought too. I was like, no. I don't know why it's different to that. It's like obviously all of the victims, but anyone who, any of the survivors, the one that fucking beat him up and all that, I'm like, oh, yeah. yes. Every survivor is something because mm. it is just, it's a lot of dark and not a lot of uh, positive moments in this. Yeah. Not a lot of wins. In 1975, it was reported to Chicago police that a man named John would regularly cruise the area in his car picking up young men. And this is a time when he would sort of openly describe it as his cruising period. They figured out this man was Gacy. The cops figured this out and staked out his home. According to the Chicago Tribune, officers observed dozens of young men going in and out of Gacy's house in unincorporated Norwood Park Township. They stopped many of them for questioning, but none said anything against Gacy. Around this time, Gacy also began his life as a clown. 
uh, joining the Jolly Joker Clown Club. <laughs> uh, he created two different clown personas, Pogo, a happy clown, and Patches, a more serious clown. Oh, my God. Again, he's just taken on another hobby. Uh, it's, it, it is strange to enter a clown phase of your life. Yeah. That's a midlife I, I crisis. I mean, I did it to pay bills during uni when I was doing it at kids' parties, but uh, to just decide, my wife left me, yep. I'm going to be a clown now. Be a clown. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one way to get back. I'm Patches now. The colonel's dead. I think he was a, around your age at this point, Dave, so, yeah. Well, I was really packed a lot into a... He was 19 years old. Short life. <laughs> Jeez, you look, you look horrible for 19, <laughs> your Dave. Your current age, you dumb Sorry, shit. Sorry, when I was clowning, I was 19, <laughs> let me just say. Let me just say. Okay, and you're saying you will never... Ever, ever, ever go back to clowning? Absolutely never. Never say never, Dave. Things could go badly for you, Dave. Oh, God, don't say that. Are you saying if we ever see you back in the clowning game that it's a bit of a cry for help? A huge cry for help. I mean, it would have been a cry for help anyway, but especially yeah, after this episode. It is episode. a honk for help. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> As these clown personas, he performed at hospitals, parades and store openings, uh, often entertaining kids, which is wild as he was a Convicted child molester. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this in previous serial killer episodes, I think. Back in the day, the states didn't communicate that well with their crime database and that Yeah, sort of I guess stuff. it was less digitised probably, right? Yeah, so just things, obviously, you move states and you could start a new life even though you probably shouldn't be allowed to be performing for mm. kids, even if he'd been living on the straight and narrow since, which obviously he has not been doing. I don't know if you've seen photos of him. He looks super creepy as Pogo. He had a painted his face white, then with big red lips, which kind of look exactly like the Batman symbol. And then his eyes were like painted big oh. blue splodges around his eyes. Uh, he later wrote an explanation for the name Pogo. He breaks it down. Do you want, do you want to hear his explanation? Absolutely. Yes. This is quoting Gacy. The reason was based on, one, that I was Polish. So that's where the Po came from, for Poles. And since I was on the go all the time, I took go and I added it to it. <laughs> that's how I came up with the name Pogo. That's a genius. A bit of an insight in, into, the, into the mind there. <laughs> when Gacy was eventually caught, the media picked up on the clowning stuff, which was where he got the nickname The Killer Clown, obviously. According to Linda Rodriguez McRobbie, writing for the Smithsonian, this media coverage of Gacy as the killer clown fueled America's already growing fears of stranger danger and sexual predation on children and made clowns a real object of suspicion. Jess is just showing the picture there. Listeners, if you're probably looking it up I too. also was looking it up and he looks terrifying. Yeah. So gross. That is not a fun clown. No. But, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Is it, and Some say because of him, you know, that's now the idea of a scary clown has in part been inspired by him. But McRobbie writes that people have been frightened by clowns for centuries, apparently. So because I someone one of the people who suggested this topic sort of in their little blurb they wrote for it suggested that he was the one who started people fearing clowns. And I'm like, oh, is that true? Were clowns sort of happy things until then? But I looked apparently people being afraid of clowns is a, a long-term thing. Right. It's also rumoured uh, but unconfirmed that Gacy helped inspire Stephen King's clown character Pennywise from It. Oh. According to Screen Rant, while there is some debate on whether Gacy truly influenced the creation of Pennywise, the two are eerily similar as both dress as clowns and target children. <laughs> Can't argue with that. Eerily similar. Eerily similar. The two clowns dress as clowns. I mean, you could say the same thing about Ronald McDonald, but he just targets children with food. Yeah. That's true. Eerily similar. With that is eerily, eerily similar. <laughs> eerily similar. I mean, he is the colonel as well. <gasps> On the 26th of July, 1976, Gacy picked up an 18-year-old hitchhiker named David Cram. Cram started working for PDM immediately, I think that night, and moved into Gacy's home the following month. What? The following day, they drank to celebrate Cram's 19th birthday and Gacy dressed up as Pogo before tricking Cram into putting on the handcuffs before telling Cram he was going to rape him. According to Cahill, though, Cram was able to kick Gacy in his stupid fucking face and freed himself from the handcuffs. I added the stupid fucking face, oh, right. but Cahill didn't say it like that. Sorry about that. 
got away from myself there. Uh, Cram <laughs> remained living at Gacy's house for another month or what? so before quitting PDM and moving out. Yeah, amazing, right? Why do you, why do you stay there? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. Gacy later suggested that he was an accomplice for some of these murders, but I don't I don't trust a lot of what Gacy says. Yeah, no. In his place uh, after he moved out, Michael Rossi moved in, who and he lived there the best part of a year. Apparently sometimes they'd go and entertain as the two clowns. Rossi would play patches while Gacy played pogo. In March of 1977, 27-year-old Jeff Rignall reported that Gacy had enticed him into his car by offering him marijuana before using chloroform to knock him unconscious before driving him to his house, handcuffing and sexually attacking him before letting him go. According to the Chicago Tribune, a $3,000 civil suit was settled in this case. Gacy was also charged with battery, a misdemeanor. So that was the outstanding battery charge, I think, that the cops would later find when investigating peace. Right. Um, but this, this, is, this went to court, was settled, but none of this seems to be, you know, making a dent in his or a dent in his public persona. It's like it's just no one's knowing about it or something. Yeah, that's wild, isn't it? Yeah, I just don't like this kind of hectic double life where you are an evil monster. Yeah. Seemingly every night and then a respected businessman during the day. Crazy. This is also from the Tribune. On December the 31st of 1977, Gacy was arrested by Chicago police after a 19-year-old teen from the north side said uh, the man kidnapped him at gunpoint and forced him to engage in sexual acts. The police report shows that when he was taken into custody, Gacy admitted to engaging in the acts with the youth and their brutality, but denied the teen was an unwilling participant. An assistant state's attorney decided not to prosecute Gacy. Why? Yeah. It just there's just so many like I'm I'm not I'm not even gonna mention half the cases and accusations and whatnot. And it just never sticks. I don't know if it's because they didn't see him, these uh, victims as being as from good families or whatever. I'm not sure if that's what it is. Or they, I m- imagine each case is more complicated than that. But they just don't have the big picture because he keeps getting away with them. Just in each case, there's no big picture to be seen somehow. So it, by this point, you must have just been feeling like uncatchable, basically. Yeah. But of course, uh, as we know, he was caught. And uh, I go back to the initial story we were talking about, Gacy's last victim, Robert Peast. So it's in part perhaps because this was the first time a police officer seemed to take the claims about Gacy really seriously. It's just lucky that this cop was like, no, I, I, I think there's more to look into, and he jumped right on the case. Mm. Gacy apparently drove Peast to his home under the guise of offering him a job. So he's, he's at the pharmacy Gacy's loudly saying, yeah, I'd, I'd pay five bucks an hour for work for me. So he's like, oh, I want to talk to him about the job. He went to talk to him while his mum's waiting. It's such a fucking heartbreaking story. They all are. He gets in the car with Gacy, goes to Gacy's house, is tricked into putting on the handcuffs and he's raped and murdered. But th- this time they're on to him. The cops are on him. The police had placed Gacy under around-the-clock surveillance. They also traced the high school ring retrieved from his home to John Chick. S-Z-Y-C, uh, a teenager who'd been missing for two years. So that's another one of his victims. That same day, on December 15, a Gacy employee told police that two former employees had also disappeared. They're starting to go, holy yeah, shit. Yeah, wow. Mm. Now they're finally bringing it all together. Gacy notices the police surveillance straight away, but he kind of befriends them. He goes out when he's leaving home, he, he, he sees him in the car, he goes over and he goes, Hey, guys. Apparently he started saying to him, hey, this is where I'm heading. I don't want you to lose me in traffic or whatever. So, you know, he's he's trying to be matesy with them. He also invited them into a cafe to eat with him at one point and they accept. They do this multiple times, eat dinner with him, eat breakfast with him. What? Uh, The officers uh, later referred to him as a blowhard and they just let him talk. He brags about his political connections, his business clout, and at one point, when talking about his Pogo, the clown alter ego, he says, you know, clowns can get away with murder. Oh. Says that to cops. 
who were following him on the suspicion of exactly that. I guess you could say I've killed before and I'll kill again anyway. Sorry, what? (laughs) I guess you could say, look under my (laughs) crossface. I dare you. Well, I mean, maybe because at first I was like these fucking cops, but I suppose there is sort of an element for someone like this is just let them talk and they will slip up eventually. Yeah, I think that's kind of what they were thinking. You know, we're, wow. we're, we're, our job is to keep an eye on him. There's no better way to keep an eye on him than sit in a booth with him. Yeah. And then the thing, we'll see what we can learn, let him talk and see what we hear. Yeah, pick up some clues. I think I had this exact same initial thought. I'm like, don't get caught. What are you doing? Don't yeah. become, but yeah. On December the 19th, so this leads to a few days later on the 19th, Gacy inviting them in to his house for breakfast. He makes them breakfast in his own house, the house where bodies are buried under the floor. Jesus, the audacity. Is yeah. that? Do you think that's like arrogance? Is that stupidity? Or do you think that's like his disconnect from reality? Like I think I can beat this lie detector test. Yeah, yeah. Hard, I guess it's hard to know. It's, yeah, all of those sound believable to yeah. me. One of the officers excuses themselves to use the bathroom, maybe have a little snoop. When they go in, the central heating turns on and uh, via the vent they could smell something awful, which they thought was pot- possibly rotting flesh. Uh, that same day, Gacy's lawyers file a $750,000 civil rights suit against Des Plaines and its police department charging that officers are harassing their client with illegal searches and seizures and destroying his reputation with their investigation. Pretty bold counterclaim. Oh, yeah, you think think our client's a murderer? Well. Well. How dare you? You've been harassing him by accepting his invitation <laughs> to come in for breakfast and we will not stand for it. While under police surveillance on December 21st, so they, I think they're the, the two... Uh, pairs of cops are, are working 12-hour shifts each. I think they're watching him 24 hours a day. It's wild that he does this, but on the 21st of December, Gacy is seen handing a package containing marijuana to a gas station clerk while he knows he's under surveillance, I think, and the police use this as an excuse to arrest him. Probably the kind of thing that maybe they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be that worried about, especially in the scheme of things. Yeah. But this just gives them a chance to bring him in. And with Gacy in custody, Des Plaines Police and Cook County Sheriff's Office investigators obtain a warrant and again enter Gacy's one-story ranch-style house. Police accuse Gacy of holding peace there against his will. They're still hoping to find him alive, I think, but I don't know how hopeful they are because they mm. threaten to tear up the floor to find the teen's body. But Gacy denies peace is there. He's, like, He's not there. I'll do another lie detector. He does though, confess, it feels like this is like him trying to negotiate or something. He does confess to killing another man, saying that he was forced to kill him in self-defense and he buried him under the concrete floor in his garage. I think the man he was referring to was John Butkovich, who was, there was no way you could argue it was self-defense. Yeah. In my head, I'm assuming, because he was buried in the garage, most of the other bodies were buried under the floor, he thought, I'll I'll admit to this one, they'll yeah. find that body and that'll keep him one. away from the other. Yeah, because yeah, they'll be like, yeah. he's clearly telling us the truth because he just admitted to having a body there, so we won't bother looking yeah. anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing that was his logic. He leads investigators to the garage and with a can of spray paint mark the floor where the body is buried. Police also discover a trapdoor in the house's crawl space, though, where they find parts of at least three bodies. So the jig is up at this point. <gasps> On December 22, in a rambling verbal statement lasting several hours, Gacy tells police he has killed 32 young men after having sexual relations with them. He talks of himself in the third person, saying the slangs and sex acts were committed by Jack or John. He says he buried the bodies of 27 victims on his property. It turned out to be 29 that were discovered. And most, like, possibly he just lost count, which is... Fucked. How do they fit? Yeah, we found, buried most of them in the crawl space. Uh, I think they were really buried close, pretty close together. The cops said when they uncovered one body in that grave, there was part of another body, like right, you know, head to foot sort of thing. So, so fucking grim. Awful. Uh, five other bodies 
four of which would be found by police, including that of Peast, were thrown into rivers south of Chicago. Stacey uh, let them know. He drew a diagram showing where the bodies are buried under his house. Uh, the reason Gacy arrived late to the police station on that initial night, uh, the night Peast went missing, uh, when he was covered in mud, you know, was, he said he'd be half an hour. He ended up being like four or five hours late. Yeah. The reason for that is he'd come straight from disposing Peace's body in the river uh, and then got in a minor car accident where his vehicle had slid off an ice-covered road and had to be towed. So, the, I mean, even the audacity of that, he's come with the dirt from disposing, disposing of, a, of one of his murder victims. Uh, Gacy was brought to trial on February 6, 1980, charged with 33 murders. He was tried in Cook County, Illinois, before Judge Lewis Garippo. There, there could be a whole extra episode on this trial, but I'll um, summarise it. The defence argued he was not guilty due to insanity. They claimed he had multiple personality disorder with four personalities, uh, the hard-working civic-minded contractor, the clown, the politician and a policeman called Jack Hanley, whom he referred to as Bad Jack. So when he was talking about it, in the third person, that was what he was saying. He was the one who did did the murder. Yeah, not me. When Gacy had confessed to police, he claimed to be confessing on behalf of Jack. His lawyers presented Gacy as a Jekyll and Hyde character, while the prosecutors presented the case that he was sane and in full control of his actions. And they gave a lot of instances of how it was premeditated. You know, he was a lot of, you know, they're talking about how he would be uh, covering the smell and all those, these sorts of things that were kind of more logical things. Yeah. Covering up his crimes. Many of his surviving victims either testified or attempted to testify with many breaking down. One became physically ill when trying to talk. Some of them just, they they really wanted to, but just couldn't, couldn't talk and had to excuse themselves. Oh, my God. The defence tried to suggest that all 33 deaths were caused by accidental erotic asphyxiation. Oh, my God. I mean, come on. If you're a lawyer, that's coming yeah. out of your mouth. Are you like, God, what am I saying? What is wrong with me? Yeah. They're all accidents. Sorry. I mean, accidents happen. Cook County Medical Examiner Robert Stein called this highly improbable. I think that's being generous. Yeah, you're right, Dave. Imagine imagine fucking Ugh. how do you sleep yeah. at night at night, at night as that lawyer? To be like, they all, it was all just an accident, you know, being a bit sexy, the erotic asphyxiation, and, yeah, it just happened 33 times. So unlucky. Can you believe so it? So unlucky. So tragic and unlucky. Oh, fuck you. After a relatively lengthy trial, the jury deliberated for less than two hours before deciding Gacy was guilty of all 33 charges of murder as well as sexual assault and taking indecent liberties with a child. At the time, his conviction for 33 murders was the most any person in US history had been convicted of. Gacy was sentenced to death for each murder. The death penalty had only come into effect the previous year in Illinois. Wow. Yeah. So he was sentenced to 33 deaths. 33 deaths, yeah. So if he'd been caught like 18 months earlier, he would have just gone to jail probably forever. Yes, for 33 life. So getting away with it kind of for a bit longer cost him his life. Yeah, that's interesting. The irony of him being like, this doesn't undo any of the wrongs that happened. You're just murdering me. Like, I don't know if, you, you know, I'm not a pro death guy necessarily or anything, but it's wild to try and take the high horse there as a. Yeah, and try to be critical of murder. <laughs> I yeah. really thought you were going to say. This doesn't undo any of the good stuff I did at kids' parties. I was a great clown, really good at the Democratic, uh, you know, with the party. So I've done good as well. Let's not forget that. I thought he was going to try and go Don't that forget. down there. We helped clean that headquarters for I've free. I've heard that it's the cleanest it's ever been. So <laughs> let's not forget. Yeah. While on death row, Gacy filed multiple appeals with none of them being successful. He suggested some of his employees had committed the bulk of the murders. Sometimes he was saying he didn't commit any of the murders. Sometimes he said, oh, I might have committed a few of them, but most of them, and I didn't even know about them, they, you know, they had keys to my house. Right. It's hard to know, but right. there are a lot of people who say that the idea he had accomplices holds a lot of weight, and some suggest that he couldn't have possibly committed all the murders alone. 
some of some of the timings of him was like he he was in the state then he must have had someone work with him but that was obviously never proven. Mm. Uh, while on death row, Gacy took up painting. Or maybe he'd already painted, but he he did a lot of painting on death row with many of the paintings being self portraits of him as a clown. Some of these paintings have sold from between two hundred dollars and twenty thousand dollars. So he was on death row for quite a few years until nineteen ninety four. When on May the tenth at twelve fifty eight a.m. he was executed via lethal injection. There was a a bit of a problem. the The injection, the fluid in the injection, coagulated. I'm not saying that right, but it sort of you know it jellified, so it couldn't go in, and they had to delay it. They pulled the curtains from the people viewing it to try to figure it out. Sort of drew, drew it out a bit. One of the um, prosecutors, I think, said later commented on it, saying. Had nothing on on the way he killed people, you know. Like, but anyway. Fuck! It is still so incredibly baffling as well that people would view a death. Yeah, there's like a go little and watch theater an gallery. Execution. That's that's fucked up. Oh, and this and the theater curtain, like someone's there yeah. on the side pulling it up. Oh, pulling. What it is back there down. a fucking interval or something? Like, do they sell snacks? It's fucked. I guess it's yeah. I guess it's for the f- the families who it's meant to be in there. I guess yeah. It's all. I mean, it's just how do you make peace with it? You know, it's not the families. Oh, it's all. It's all obviously a real mess. There's no yeah. obvious answers with any of this stuff. Yeah, true. His final meal was uh, or included a bucket of KFC chicken, and his final words were reportedly, "Kiss my ass." Oh, charming. He uh, never really, um, what do you say, he never really showed remorse. Yuck. For the murders. Uh, there was an estimated crowd of a 1,000 people gathered outside, most of whom were celebrating his execution. Um, there were some people there to sort of protest the death penalty as an idea because I guess it was still brand still new. new yeah. And if you, it's the thing, if you're, if you're anti-death penalty, you've got to be anti-death penalty <laughs> across the board, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, but that, I imagine that would have been... That's really showing that you believe in it if you're going to John Wayne Gacy's yeah. execution to protest. I'd probably be chanting a little quieter that day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> don't kill him. No, <laughs> hey, no, every life, very precious, don't. <laughs> the week of his execution, a couple of businessmen bought various of his artworks at an auction. Apparently, the auction, there was all sorts of things up for sale, including furniture and stuff. And when they started bidding on Gacy's thing, they got a real weird vibe in the room. They're like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And then they quickly were like, no, 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 it's, 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 this isn't like that. We're not fans or anything. Because they, the reason they did that is because they held a public bonfire the month after his execution where relatives of seven of Gacy's victims were among the 100 people present. Uh, according to Milica Marino of Chicago, whose brother Michael Marino was killed by Gacy, uh, she said, I wish it was Gacy, but it's a piece of him. It doesn't bring my brother back, but it makes it better. Wow. And uh, a, a sister of another victim, uh, Kari Cahoon, said the bonfire was good therapy for herself and other victims' relatives. Bit of catharsis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Wow. That's the end of my report. Any questions? I feel like I've, I've got a lot more info in my head that I'm, I'm uh, willing to let out. If uh... I have a question. Yes? You okay, bud? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. I mean, I, I, when you research something like this, I definitely, like, I understand the fascination with it. And there are times where it is, you know, it is interesting. Some of the documentaries I watched were, you know, well put together. Yeah. There was one uh, recent series, might have even been from this year, on NBC's Peacock streaming service, which had a lot of not-seen-before interview footage with Gacy, and it's just so weird seeing a monster who's just this sort of sort of mild-mannered, polite, can't like you can you can sort of tell but i mean it's the knowledge you're bringing to him but it's yeah. just sort of it's very strange yeah to watch him yeah yeah they can be um pretty weird topics to live in for a week or so how do you reckon those people that interview him for like you know 
hours on end and then yeah. write books and think about it for like three years straight. Like, how do they cope? Yes. How do they cope? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I was thinking about that too. This Peacock series has the guy is also a talking head, the guy who went in and interviewed him. He, he sort of, they, they um, communicated via letters. He was a journalist and then eventually went in and he, he sat with him for like six plus hours at a time. And um, yeah, he said stuff like he. Um, there were times. Oh no, was was it him? No, no, that was the um, the New Yorker article. I was reading. It was another that, that journalist also sat with him a lot, and he was saying at some points it felt like time was standing still. He was just talking and talking. So at different times, the journalist took his watch off so that he didn't see how slowly time was moving. Right. Wow. I'm so bored listening to this. <laughs> Serial killer. I mean, it, it's it's the kind of thing that would probably hurt him more than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> a yawn. Honestly, <laughs> gave you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you think you're interesting. Yeah, I've heard this bit. Heard this bit. Yeah. So sorry, Poe is from Polish. Go. I'm always on the go. Yeah, yeah. Very. Cool. Yeah, go. That it's is a very good clever story. It's incredible. I guess my. A clown name would be like I'm Irish and fairly sedentary, so <laughs> R said. Oh, R said. <laughs> I'm more of an adult clown. <laughs> R said the clown. Yeah, beautiful name for a boy Thank or you. a girl. Thank clown. you. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think then that brings us. I mean, we've kicked off block. It's happened. We've done it's it. It's happened, baby. We're here. We're doing Thanks it. Thanks for getting through with me. I know these episodes definitely divide listeners. Obviously, they're very popular, but there are also some people who find them pretty tough. I yeah. imagine a lot of them wouldn't have even listened to it, but um, thanks for listening. Uh, and there is no no one can deny that that is definitely a blockbuster topic. A lot of people want us to talk about it. One of the yeah. most famous serial killers of the 20th century. It's mm. a block topic. Yeah. Just for wild. better or worse. <laughs> Seen it in the hat for a long time and, uh, you know, you, you, you flick through the hat to put topics up for vote, you know, just a normal weekly vote. And I've definitely clicked on it a couple of times and like, mm, nah. Yeah. No, I, I don't want to do that. No, not feeling strong enough for that one at the moment. <laughs> uh, anyway, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show uh, where we thank a lot of our great supporters, the people who keep this show running, who support us at patreon.com slash dogonpod or dogonpod.com. Uh, the first people we like to thank are on the Sydney Scheinberg level. If you're on this level, you can give us a fact, a quote, or a question. This section has a little jingle that goes something like this. Fact, quote, or question. He always remembers the ding. Uh, now, to get involved in this, you, you sign up on the Sydney Scheinberg level and you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. You also get to give yourself a title. Uh, this week, firstly, I'd love to read out the question from Matthew Bohr. And Matthew Bohr has given himself the title of that guy you may have passed driving in his car laughing uncontrollably at a Dugan riff. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite thing to hear about Dugan listeners is people laughing on the train, in the yeah. car, in the office, at the gym. Love it. So it's good to know, Matthew, that you can be seen that way. Uh, Matthew's question is, without notice, after seeing Dave write a mechanical clam for money on an ad, <laughs> it took me, I had to get right to the ad part where I'm like, hang on, what? what? Is this a dream you had? <laughs> yeah. Or a nightmare, I should say. Oh, come on, that's a dream, come on. Does this ad run, this would only run in Australia? I believe I so. It's, it's, a, a, it's an H&R Block ad, so it's a, an accounting ad. Sorry, Jess. H&R Sorry, Jess. Block Day, very appropriate very for this month. Very good. H&R Block Day, they should have sponsored this episode. They really should have. Uh, is that on brand for them? <laughs> yeah. Killer Clown? <laughs> yeah, that's why they passed. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew writes, after seeing Dave write a mechanical clam for money on an ad, I thought of how fun it would be to have you three on a game show or different media format. If not limited by a podcast format, what would be something you would want to try doing as the Dugong crew, either as a main episode, Patreon bonus or a video, etc.? Some fun things that come to mind for me, a Hot One style episode or a Taskmasters style episode. Are they fun? I don't know what Hot 
Ones is, but I know Taskmaster. So, that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, hot Ones is like a very popular YouTube show where celebrities are interviewed whilst eating hot wings, and they're really, oh, really. Oh, I have heard of that. Yeah, great. Well, that sounds fun. Um, yeah, I'd be up for either of those things. Doesn't sound fun for my asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't film that bit amazingly, <laughs> which I think is a mistake. That's yeah. That's where we will be different. <laughs> we'll have. The toilet cam. There'll be no coward options in the edit room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I mean, we, we've we been uh, meeting on and off about the next video project we're going to do, which is now overdue, but we've got a few things in the works. We're trying, we're talking to some people about getting some funding together to make some things happen. Yeah. We've got, we've got, I, I think we add to the pile all the time. Last time we spoke, I added a new idea in there. <laughs> But I reckon at the moment we've got about eight different working options. Any any ones that are um, developed enough to mention, Dave or Jess? Don't think quite. Yeah, it's hard. Things being pushed back, obviously, yeah. with the uh, lockdown 6.0 going forever. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll keep them under wraps for now. But any yeah. ideas that just pop to your head? I think a Taskmasters style show would be a lot of fun. That'd be really fun. I thought it'd be fun to do a series where we take it in turns to take the other two out to, to partake in, in a hobby or some, one of our interests. Uh, I think my original idea would Dave would take Jess and I out uh, clothes shopping. Because Dave loves to shop. Dave loves I to mean, shop. I mean, I'm always He's a fashionista. found at Chadston, you know me. Fashion capital. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. I thought maybe I could take you guys out to uh, play some golf or something or, um, yeah, something that, you know, we would all... It'd have to be something that you'd feel a bit silly doing, I suppose. I guess I could take you guys to get our nails done. I'd love that. Oh, I'd love that. <laughs> Stop me biting them. Get a petty. Manny petty. You'd love a manny petty. I don't know the budget that we need for this, but I'd love to do like a, uh, I'd love to just try it because it looks fun. Do one of those wipeout style obstacle courses or like, Fuck or like yes. a ninja warrior type thing, but for normal people. Yeah. I feel like I, here's the thing. I feel like I would either be, incredible at that or terrible nowhere in between i can definitely picture possibly all three of us falling at the very first hurdle <laughs> yeah oh big time <laughs> so there's there's this huge obstacle course and we all fall in the water <laughs> half a meter immediately into the <laughs> which would be a bit of fun <laughs> that'd be so That's fun right. love it took to the crew that. four days to set it up and we both last eight seconds i have always wanted to try trapeze Oh, you've you said that, that before, yeah. I would 100% do that. Don't know if I have the core strength to get my legs up and around the butt, but I can work on that. Yeah. If we ever get to New Zealand, which, you know, we were kind of thinking we were going to have done earlier this year at mm. one point, which is funny to think about now, <laughs> but um, maybe next year. Uh, they've got some of the most beautiful bungee jumps in the world. Could do one of them together maybe. I would happily oh. hold your bag while you did that. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to really think about it. Probably vomit a couple of times and then go. Well, thanks so much for that question, Matthew Bohr. I think that good was a, a good one. And that's definitely something we think about a lot. Um, so hopefully we will have more of that sort of stuff uh, for you to actually see maybe next year. But a bunch of fires in the oven. Is that what you say? Sticks in the fire? Irons in the fire. Sticks in the Found oven. It. That's it. <laughs> A lot of buns in the oven. <laughs> um, Jacob Lane, uh, who's called himself, you can call me Ray or you can call me Jay <laughs> or you can call me Ray J, which is a great Gabbo reference. Great work. Who is, is Gabbo a real thing, Dave? I always assumed it wasn't, but I have a vague feeling that maybe it is based on oh, something. I think that you can thing. call me Ray thing is, is based on something too. Oh, that's what's the you real thing. You can call me mm. Ray or you can call me Jay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking of. Gabbo is not real. <laughs> G- Gabbo, a living, a living mannequin. Um, so Jacob has got a fact for us, which is Jacob. If you don't know, is our resident Simpsons expert. Mm. Um, Jacob writes, not a Simpsons related fact, I'm afraid, but oh. it does combine two of my other loves. Did you know that according to Wikipedia.org, Queen invented thrash metal, sort of. It says that among the earliest songs credited with influencing future thrash musicians was Queen's Stone Cold Crazy from their album Sheer Heart Attack. Great album title. Mm. 
That's not my words. That's Jacob's. Oh, yeah. Jacob's words. And I agree. Uh, which was recorded and released in 1974. The song was described as being thrash metal before the term had been invented. That's interesting. I think um, the first time I heard that song was Metallica covering it. And that, I think, on their album of uh, songs and artists that influenced them in the early days. So huh. that makes a lot of sense. There you go. You're a big Queen fan, aren't you, Bopper? Yeah, I love it. I love a bit of Queen. Thank you so much for that fact, Jacob. Well, we've got Jacob on, on the mind. We are talking Simpsons. I've just looked up Simpsons, uh, their wiki page on Behind the Laughter on Gabbo. He gets his name apparently from the title character of the 1929 film The Great Gabbo. In the film, Gabbo is a ventriloquist who operates a dummy named Otto. So there's some connection to a real, at least right. ventriloquist operator. And can can you look up the You Can Call Me Ray, You Can Call Me Jay bit? Because I know people are yelling at their iPods right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one comes from Ben Oliver, who's given himself the title of Overprotective Detective Inspector. Uh, then he says in brackets, I'm not really a detective inspector. I just think it sounds fun. It does. <laughs> You're right, it does. D.I. Ben, you are bang on. Uh, And Ben's asking us a question, which is, apologies if this has been asked before. Please never apologise to us, Ben. Never apologise to us. You never have to apologise. Take that word out of your vocab when you're talking to us, please, Ben. Okay? Ben writes or asks, do any of you have a favourite book that you go back to and read over and over again? I read The Shining at least once a year, and I also read Slaughterhouse Five at least once a year. Oh, that's interesting. I um, I've read Slaughterhouse Five a few times, and uh, yeah, I quite like the works of Kurt Vonnegut. Am I saying that right, Dave? Oh yeah. I've only ever seen it written it down. Vonnegut. Vonnegut. Um, I haven't read it for. Quite some time. Shit, now I can't remember. Uh, the the ones I read heaps as a teen, I always went back to, was Looking for Ella Brandy and On the Jellicoe Road, both by the same author, Melina Marchetta. Um, yeah, read, read those a lot. But I haven't had a book that's really grabbed me in the same way since in that I keep going back to it. Does that make sense? But those two, On the Jellicoe Road, it's like a young adult fiction kind of book, but it was a. It's got lots of good twists, and it's written. It's it's structured in a really cool way, so I always liked reading that one. Love that. I've never read any of her books, but I, I mean, and I haven't even seen the film. It was quite a big film in Australia. Looking for Alan. Yeah, Randy. it was. Yeah, big book, big film. Yeah, I think it, it was maybe maybe after my time, but uh, I think it was a big school book as well. Yeah, often on the curriculum, but I somehow I. Didn't do that one during school. Yeah, I'm just, I just had to Google the name of it. It's funny, a book that I've read, well, I'd say read, listened to three times, <laughs> and, um, but I didn't even know the name of it. It's uh, Bill Bryson's Made in America, which is it's just a real fascinating book about how the American uh, English evolved mm. and how, the, you know, American English event, invented so many commonly used words. That yeah, just found, find it really fascinating. It's just a just a nice little history book to listen to. Yeah, Dave, I imagine um, reading so many books as you do for book cheat, you probably don't have a lot yeah. of time to go back and reread. <laughs> That's right. I can never go back. Sorry, <laughs> I've got to keep looking forwards to the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always looking ahead. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Did you ever have one before? Because I mean, the point you started the book cheat podcast. Listeners don't know, Dave does a, a podcast about classic novels where he reads them so you don't have to. It's pretty much this show, but instead of a historical report, it's a uh, it's like a book report. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I did start it, I think you're alluding to, because I stopped reading for a while and this really makes me mm. makes me read. It's worked. It's worked, everyone. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you did, there was no books back in the day. Oh, I've read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas a few times. Loved that when I was in high school. That's probably the one I've, I've read the most, I think. That book about Johnny Depp. Yeah, that's right. That right? Yeah, the Johnny Depp autobiography. <laughs> you just think of another one, Bobba? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I read the Hunger Games series a couple of times at least. I've seen all of those films. Does that count? No. Oh, I would have said. <laughs> was that the question? Yeah. <laughs> was that the question? Yes. Was that the question? What's a movie you've watched a heap of times? No, sorry, it wasn't. No, sorry. you fucking dog. <laughs> 
Now, the movie <laughs> I've watched the most times would be Casino Royale, and I just watched it again the other day. The old one or the newer one? New one. Because is that the one where there was like it was Bond but as a comedy? Yeah, it's like a parody of Bond, which is always funny to me because it's like, well, I mean, it's kind of a piss take a little bit too anyway, isn't it? Right. With like exploding pens and all sorts of stuff. And the final uh, fact quarter question for this week comes from David Malofsky, a.k.a. A Place to Hang Your Cape, um, an English f- or American in England, isn't he? And we've met him a few times when we've been over there. Lovely fella. He's got a website, Place to Hang, hang Your Cape, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you've got a cape, that's a place hang to up. hang it. Uh, and David's given himself the title of Worst Singer in the Podcaper's Halloween Musical. Um, which is especially, I think they do, yeah, they do musical episodes. So it's, I mean, I love that, that you believe to be the worst singer. (laughs) Invite me on. I'll bump you down a spot. (laughs) Uh, David has offered us a fact. Here it is. Mm. Oh, I like this. He says, I thought I'd sneak in a brag along with a fact on this one. I think this is our first brag since we said we can we can also accept oh, yeah, brags. Yeah, there could be brags or compliments, I think, was another one as well. But, yeah, <laughs> okay, quote great. quote or question yeah, or complimental brags. brags. Bing. <laughs> uh, my podcast, Podcapers, is doing our fifth annual Halloween musical episode this year, debuting or debuting, <laughs> depending on Where whatever the Birmingham people want me to say. I've never been, I think, maybe more than anything else, I've never had my confidence um, battered so much as being laughed at when I said either debut or debut <laughs> at that last Birmingham show. <laughs> and mate, every time I say the word, I doubt myself. Now. Yeah. Uh, similar to saying nuclear or nuclear or whatever because mm. of George W. Bush. Yeah. Um, normally we're a comic book podcast, but every Halloween we do a fully scripted musical episode. This year is the epic finale you won't want to miss. Luckily, because I'm a terrible singer, I don't have any songs this time. Look for Podcapers wherever you listen to your podcast or at podcapers.com. I also wanted to offer the very first pun fact in the show's history. A Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but you mean your mother. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good bit. (laughs) <laughs> and somehow they got me. <laughs> should have seen, should have seen something like that coming, but That's I did good. it. That's good stuff. Uh, he says both a fact and a pun. Is that a pun? Good question. Is that a pun? I'm not sure. I don't know what they are. I love that uh, that David is celebrating the end of, or actually the halfway mark of Blocktober with a musical episode. I think that's fantastic. So good. Uh, thank you for the questions and facts this week and brags. And brags. And just to uh, end that segment, I can tell you that the Ray joke on The Simpsons seems to come from 70s comedian Ray J. Johnson, also known as right. R.J. Johnson, who apparently had a bit where he'd say, don't call me Johnson. So I think okay. it's a joke on that. <laughs> That's a good bit. <laughs> That's a good bit. Don't call me Johnson. Hilarious. That is a good bit. One of those had to be their bits, but a great yeah, deal. Yeah, it's still funny nonetheless. So another thing we like to do is thank a few of our other supporters. Bop normally comes up with a bit of a game based on the topic. Always harder in a serial killer one. What can you pull out from this one? What's your clown name? Your Oof, clown name, fantastic. Nice. So obviously if we've got a, a place uh, where they're from, we've got the first two letters down. Then we just have to think of... The second two letters from what they are, what's their essence? Okay, so we just made it so much harder, but okay, yes, Haven't we, we made can it do easier? that. We can do I, that. I thought I made it easier, but I made it harder. <laughs> now let's give it a crack. Fuck, what am I like? What are you like? So, uh, if I could kick it off, I'd love to thank from Collingwood, just near us in Melbourne, Megan Velo. Okay, so first letters co. And, oh, okay, Megan, always uh, drinking hot cocoa. So, so Coca-Cola. Her... Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola. The extra co- Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola the clown. Co- well, I mean, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola the clown's That's probably fun. already taken. So The extra coat is a typo. Yeah. And she starts a franchise company or corporation called Coca-Cola. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have to do a quick count make sure <laughs> I got all four there. <laughs> did, I, did I do that right? Uh, thank you so much, Megan, for your support over the last year and a half, whatever. Co, co, co. I'd also love to thank from Tyler in Texas in the United States, Jake Hansen, Ty. Ty die. Ty die, because he loves dying. Loves things. dying. Things, dying like colours. Yeah, yeah, and his hair. He's always yeah, dying yeah. it. Blue. It's every yeah. time you, every week you see him and it's like, you're blonde now, and then you see him the next week, it's blue now, you know? Great lot of fun. hair colour. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. You're yeah. a fun, Jake, you are a fun guy. <laughs> you are a fun guy. Tie dye. Uh Thank you so much to you. And finally from me, I'd love to thank from Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, Michelle Rooten. Oh, what about? Rooten tootin, Michelle Rooten. What about Bogo the clown? Because Michelle Bogo loves her food on the go. On the Love go. Love that, yes. Bogo. 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 Bogo the clown. Always the rootin' tootin' cowboy. <laughs> the rootin' tootin' cowboy clown. Bogo. <laughs> I hope it's not rotten. Rotten. Rooten? Rotten. Either way, beautiful name, Michelle. Rooten or rotten. Um, would you like to thank a few, Jess? Yes, I would love to thank from Minneapolis in Minnesota. Ah, the Twin Cities. The thing I learnt and I love saying things I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think with St. Is it St. Pauli? St. Paolo? Is the other Twin City? Oh, St. Paul. Am I saying that right? St. Paul, oh, my God. St. <laughs> Paolo. <laughs> I try to add a little, a little bit of difficulty to that. A little bit of spice St. Paul. David was generally looking at me like, oh, I was thinking, what? I was like, you're doing a bit. Um, I, would, I would love to thank Hans Christensen. Fuck off. Hans Christensen Anderson. <laughs> yeah. From the Brothers Grimm? Yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. People screaming at their the iPods. The fairy tale monger uh, himself. <laughs> Hans Christensen. So yeah, Min or yeah, Min. Oh, Min's Min. Min nice. loves putting things in the rubbish can. Min bin the clown. <laughs> Min bin. <laughs> really good. Always recycling. Always picking up litter. Doing the right thing. Yeah, putting it in the bin. One. Classic. Yes. Hans Christensen. Anderson, the brothers, Grim, Min Bin. <laughs> Min Bin. Uh-uh. Min Bin, the clown. Min Bin. A um, l- little closer to home from Mooney Ponds here in Melbourne, I would love to thank Tubby Glanville. Oh, so from Mooney Ponds, so we're looking at Mo. Mo. Tubby, already a strong clown name. Oh, but... incredible. What about Mojo? Oh, Mojo. What's, what's he like doing? Jogging. <laughs> Jogging. <laughs> Jogging Tubby on the Glanville spot. loves a jog. It's funny, uh, during Comedy Festival, Tubby stopped me on the street and he said, when you, <laughs> he said, uh, I think it was, he was saying, I'm Tubby from <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> and he said, you read my name out, my normal boring name, which is, I can't remember, it was Craig or something like that. And he's like, I don't want to be Craig, call me Tubby. <laughs> and he's obviously, he's changed it on there. So we didn't even, yeah. I didn't even have to remember that. So well I'm, done, Tubby. Well done, Tubby. AKA it's so funny Mojo to the clown. run into someone on the street and yell, I'm Tubby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's definitely, I'm remembering it slightly wrong. but No, no. That's I remember how it, it being is in a my really head. nice moment anyway. I'm Tubby. <laughs> Good on you, Tubby. You sound you, Tubby. like an absolute legend. Uh, finally, for me, I would love to thank from Union City in New Jersey, Gerardo Alcala. From Union City. So it's Union might have said your name wrong there, so I'm, I do apologise. I reckon he loves riding bikes. He's Unicycle the Clown. Oh. <laughs> he rides a tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> it's very disappointing when you've booked Unicycle and he rocks up on a trike. You're like, oh, come on. Yeah. Like, oh. He's like, have you ever tried? It's hard. Bikes are <laughs> Even two wheels is difficult. I kept yeah. falling over. <laughs> yeah. Give me a third. One wheel, easy. <laughs> Big claim at a party is they can ride without training wheels. <laughs> like three-year-old, four-year-old kids are like, that's actually pretty impressive. I can't do that. <laughs> that is actually sick. Union City, New Jersey. Sounds fantastic. I want to be there. Can't wait to visit New Jersey once more. Spent a great day there watching Rutgers play college football. Were you at the game or in a pub? No, I was oh, at the game. Cool. I don't know, what was the, they had a cool thing there. Like every time they scored a touchdown, maybe there was a knight on horseback who would run. 
like the field, but they didn't really score many touchdowns. So, it... <laughs> oh, a night on standby is so tragic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that means it's your turn to thank a few. I'd Dave. love to thank some people. Next up is going to be a little bit more difficult for us because this person is from location unknown, can only assume deep within the fortress of the moles. I would like to thank Sarah, Catherine, Murphy. I guess foe, we've yeah. got to say for fortress. fortress. Yep. FOMO. <laughs> FOMO loves mowing the lawn. <laughs> loves to mow the lawn. Every week, like... Can I mow the lawn? It's like, it hasn't actually grown back <laughs> enough, mate. I don't think it needs a mow. Just hit, please. Just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Just knock it on the neighbour's doors. Does your garden need mowing? I'll do it. <laughs> it's like, okay. Do you want, you know, do you want 10 bucks for it? No. <laughs> um, and that's Sarah. She just loves. I'd feel bad taking your money. Yeah. I'm getting as much enjoyment as you are getting a neat lawn if not more this is more for me than you <laughs> thank you sarah i actually feel guilty <laughs> this is an absolute treat for me so thank you sarah you little weirdo <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up i would love to thank from tilopia in the australian capital territory up in canberra sophia drury Sophia drury telephone the clown she loves uh speaking on the phone in french La phone. Telephone the clown, which they, of course, call Le Telephone. <laughs> Absolutely nailed that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful language. Oh, yeah. Well, someone gets it right like that, it's beautiful. Language of love. Oh, yeah. Just oh, so beautiful. Sophia Drury, a fantastic name as well. Incredible. Telephone the clown. That's fun. <laughs> That's a fun clown. And finally, I would like to thank from Kent in Ohio, God's country in the United States of America. Oh, God's country, the great state <laughs> Nick, of Ohio. I'm so big jealous shout out of to you. to Nick Moyer. Nick Moyer from Ke. Ke. Ketamine the clown. <laughs> Ketamine the clown. Because <laughs> he loves to, to he loves to mine. He loves to mine. Ketamine. <laughs> I didn't Google it when I came up with it, okay? I got the website and then it was a mistake, but I, but I got it. I registered the business name before I'd really looked into it. More of an adult clown, I, I guess. I got a five-year five deal a, on the business name. A horse sidekick. The big finale is the, the two, his two sidekicks in the horse fall into a K-hole. This was my second game. My first name, Heroin the Clown, didn't work out either, so I had to rebrand. <laughs> I'm not painting the car again. It's ketamine. Well, thank you very much to Nick, Sophia, Sarah, Gerardo, Tubby, Hans, Michelle, Jake and Megan. The last thing we need to do is thank a few of our long-term supporters and welcome them into the Triptych Club. If you are a supporter at the shout-out level or above for three straight years, we welcome you into the Triptych Club or Triptych Club if you want to say it. How I believe is correctly. Stop saying that, honestly. It's not canon <laughs> to say it correctly. I just feel guilty, Dave, because someone said they'd learnt the word from us and they got into an argument uh, correcting someone, saying it's you're saying uh, it wrong. And they would they would never so assume adamant. we're right. I learnt it from my year 10 uh, art teacher, so let's blame Miss Dale. Oh, okay. Well, I learned it from you. So anyway, so uh people have been supporting us for three straight years. Get welcome to another triptych. Triptych Club, uh, which is a club where all your dreams come true. I'm standing at the door. I'm going to read out your name. Dave's going to hype you up. He's your hype man, bringing you in. Jess then hypes up Dave. Every hype man needs a hype woman. <laughs> and uh, Dave's normally booked a band. You got a book for us in the club this I week, got a Dave? Book. Sorry, a band to book? Have you booked a band? I got many books. I got many, many books. Have you banned a book? What are you, What is, what is this bloody, is this uh, what a dictatorship <laughs> here? You're not going to let us read books? Well, I've actually... Uh, no, we don't want you to ban a book, Dave. I've actually book booked a a, an Australian band. Uh, they are a punk band formed in Melbourne in 2009 and they are simply called Clowns. You know Clowns? Oh, I love Clowns. Great band. Great. Thank you so much. Dave. They're Thank really so good. Clowns are playing. Jess, do you have a cocktail? No pressure? Uh, yes, we have uh, the Joker cocktail, which I've just Googled. Love it. Um, and Clown Jello Shots. Ooh. Great, yes. great options. Yeah. As well as the bar is so well stocked now. Every drink that Jess has ever mentioned is still available yeah. as well. Uh, so just four inductees this week, Dave. Are you ready to welcome them in? I am ready. All right. Here we go. Jess, you ready to 
Look after Dave here. I am never not ready. We've got this week from holiday in Utah in the United States, Preston Hands. Oh, let me hands you the keys to the kingdom. Come yes. on in. I'm like, Dave's got so many options here. Holiday, yeah. Preston yeah. Hands. Yeah. A lot of a lot of words aren't coming to me tonight. I'm glad I'm not having to do what Dave's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Fertile ground is what I was going to say. Um now from Birmingham in Great Britain, it's Gary J from the UK. Oh, uh, Gary J, he's more than okay. Yeah, he's Don Bradman, pretty good. <laughs> Don Bradman's average was 99.94, but your average here is 100 out of 100. Ooh. From Abbotsford in British Columbia in Canada, it's Aaron Dawson. Aaron Dawson, more like Aaron Awesome. Yes. <laughs> And finally, from Oslo in Norway, it's Erica de la Cruz. Ooh, Erica de la Cruz on in. Grab yourself a Joker cocktail. Yes, All right, yes, raise yes, the roof. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Welcome in, Erica, Aaron, Gary, and Preston. And that brings us to the end of this episode, the first one of Blocktober. Huge. Hopefully, everyone had a great time with us here. Mm. It was a roller coaster of sorts. <laughs> we set the tone for a great couple of months. <laughs> Once you get the grimmest one out of the way, looking ahead, this is, I believe, although I haven't looked into all of them deeply, I'm pretty sure this is easily the grimmest topic of Blocktober. So we'll tick that it's one all off. It's all uphill. I mean, there is definitely some other <laughs> grimmish things, but this is the grimmest. So. Yeah, <laughs> this is grim number one. All right. <laughs> got out of the way. Oh, but thank you so much for launching us headstrong into Block, Matt. We appreciate you. Didn't shy away from the topic. You did a lot of research, put yourself in, in a dark place for this pod, and we appreciate you doing that. Thank in you. In a lot of ways, I'm I'm a hero, aren't I? You are a hero, yes. You're my hero. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. For sure. I've always said that. That, that means a lot. If people want to suggest a topic, and then we'll give a shout-out when we, when we get to the topic, anyone can do that at any time at dogoonpod.com. And that's the same place where you can support us, either there or patreon.com slash dogoonpod. Keep this show going. We give out all those bonus episodes and all sorts of fantastic things. We're up to over 120 bonus episodes that you can instantly access if you support us on there now, as well as a bunch of other stuff. And you can get in contact with us at Do Go On Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can email us anytime, do go on pod at gmail.com. But I believe that's the first episode of Block Done and Dusted. Thank you so much. We'll be back next week with another blocktastic episode. But until then, I will say thank you and goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye.